All right, welcome folks who are just joining us. Thanks so much for coming out this evening. Hope you've been enjoying today's uh, nice weather. It was rainy this morning, but it's been beautiful the last several hours. So uh, thanks for uh, stepping back inside to learn about something pretty darn important here. Uh, my name is Sean. I'm with the North Branch Nature Center. Uh, I want to thank everybody for uh, your support of the Nature Center and the programming that we've been doing over the last several months. Um, we've been having a great webinar series since the middle of March now, and it, it's really a, a pleasure to be able to invite uh, wildlife services and invite Owen to be able to, uh, to wrap up our season uh, until we resume again in the fall. Uh, Owen is, uh, has been working with wildlife services for oh, 16 years now, doing some really great work on everything from uh, habitat conservation to disease ecology to uh, wildlife management. Uh, wildlife services is definitely a lesser, uh, a lesser known um, agency in Vermont, but are doing some really, really great work. And so I'm really pleased to be able to uh, to use the Nature Center's platform here to help showcase their work. Um, I'll mention a couple of things. Please go ahead and uh, ask questions by throwing them in the, in the chat bar. And, uh, and I will, uh, I'll pitch those to Owen as we go and we can do a little uh, Q&A at the end as well. So please do ask any questions you have um, in the chat bar as we go. And uh, finally, we are trying to preserve uh, some of the internet connectivity over on Owen's end. So he's gonna have his, uh, his video off to hopefully uh, improve the, um, the, the reception quality and the connectivity and everything like that. So, uh, so uh, apologies in advance that we can't, uh, we can't see Owen, but that's by design. Um, but uh, I want to, yeah, say thank you very much. And thank you to Owen for, uh, for sharing your wisdom with us this evening. Well, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Um, my name is Owen Montgomery. I'm a rabies biologist or wild dog biologist with the USDA Wildlife Services. Uh, rather small part of the agency of the USDA, but um, we are doing some kind of neat and inventive stuff out there. So I just kind of wanted to bring you through what we've been doing in recent years um, as far as research and, um, you know, disease surveillance and things of that nature. Um, I apologize. It is kind of a lot of information. I'm going to breeze through a lot of what could take two or three hours. Um, but Again, jot down your questions, uh, send them in the chat bar, do whatever you got to do, and then we'll uh, hopefully we can get them answered at the end of the session. So thank you again. <clears throat> so in the year 2015, USDA Wildlife Services um, embarked on a, um, a study revolving around um, an experimental bait delivery system um, that is something that we have never used um, in the state of Vermont before. This area has always been vaccine baited with, with a product called VRG since 2002, but we never really monitored it. We didn't really know how we were doing. Uh, we baited it every year, but we didn't do any sampling to see how we were doing on the landscape. Um, so this, this study involved um, both urban and suburban. Um, it was all ground baiting and all geocoded, which I'll get to in a second. So these are all baits that are placed by hand, literally out of the vehicle um, or on foot, uh, on bicycle, uh, through slingshots, you name it, we've, we've done it all. So these areas <clears throat> varied from low human intensity to high human intensity, including medium as well. So basically that means how many people are in this area and what could, what could we maybe expect for, for a vaccine response um, in these areas. So these areas were baited at 150 on rev baits per kilometer squared, which is double our normal bait density um, for the rest of the state. We kind of assumed that there was a high raccoon density somewhere in the neighborhood of greater than 15 um, individuals per kilometer squared, fairly high. Um, and even in the north end of Burlington, which is that high um, picture there that you see, you would be surprised how many raccoons were, were in there. And I, and I sure was as well. Um, so we trapped cells based on a gradient of human, human development, low, medium, and high. So what we did is we set up basically 12 zones, and it was all in the greater Burlington area, all five towns. And um, these zones were picked by human intensity, intensity gradient, as I mentioned before. Um, they were baited with this new on-rab experimental bait um, at 150 baits per kilometer squared. Um, and we set up the study based off this, um, this model um, given to us by the National Rabies Management Program. 
So to skip around just a little bit, because it's hard not to, um, between 2015 and 2017, we baited this greater Burlington area um, with six larger, what we call grids, averaging about 4,000 baits um, in an area of 30, 37 uh, square kilometers. Um, so that's how we were hand baiting these areas at the time, just to kind of put that in your head for future slides. It was very intensive, a lot of miles driven, a lot of hours spent, um, and it was, it was new to us. And at the same time, we, uh, we marked every single bait that we put on the ground. So we knew where they went, um, so we could tell how well we were distributing them. And we used what's called a point of interest uh, unit, which is basically a GPS. Um, it's push button technology, waterproof, crush proof. Um, they can each log up to 250,000 waypoints. Um, and they have a, you know, a, a longstanding rechargeable battery. So this let us know uh, where our baits were going inside our study area. So you can kind of see a snapshot of those, those original 12 study cells and how many baits and in what intensity they were placed inside those zones. And a lot of this has to do with access too. A lot of places we can't get to um, or are very tough to get to. So we trapped a lot of raccoons and skunks, as you can see here <clears throat> in 2015. So that kind of triggered, we, we trapped so many skunks that that kind of triggered this graduate research. Um, done by an employee of ours, where she wanted to study um, skunk and, re and raccoon um, urban ecology as it relates to where we put baits. Are we putting the baits where they need to go um, so that these animals can intersect them and, and take up our bait? So all the individual um, colors and blurbs over here are different home ranges of animals that had collars put on them through our trapping efforts. So it's kind of neat to see um, where their home ranges are. And those particular ones are all raccoons. And they don't really go that far, especially in this suburban urban habitat. So some of the things we found, um, this yellow and, and, and orange odd shaped creature is, uh, those are home ranges of individual skunks. Um, so SO1, as she was named, um, had a home range of only three tenths of a mile. So that's the clover leaf right there by the University of Milan Burlington. So you can kind of picture it. And you can see that she never crossed the highway. But you can also see if you overlay where we actually put baits that year, that we didn't get too many baits into where her home range is. So therefore, she did not serial convert. And what that means is she didn't eat a bait to be sufficiently vaccinated against the rabies virus. <clears throat> Also, on the other side of the road, um, we had a male, male skunk. His home range was a little bigger, and that was typical, we found. Uh, that still doesn't really go that far. In fact, he only crossed Wilson Road one time. Um, and we only got 49 baits in his home range. And you can see where they are by the purple dots. So we just we weren't getting them in front of these animals. And, and therefore, um, he did not see her convert either and become sufficiently vaccinated. Uh, against the rabies virus. <clears> the <throat> same time we found with raccoons, and this is the old north end of Burlington, um, there's two specific home ranges there of R14 and R13. Um, and not a whole lot of baits getting in their home ranges, is there, guys? And so we, we learned that we may need to start changing our baiting activities um, and, and methods in the ways that we're doing that so that we can put these baits in front of, in front of these um, animals uh, to, to gain the best chance at, at them taking the bait and becoming vaccinated. <clears throat> so the difference between the 2017, how we baited it there in 2018 and 2019, we switched it up from these six larger zones where we essentially just drove around and put baits wherever we could to one kilometer cells that were each assigned a certain amount of baits. So it forced you to drive every road in there 
um, and bait every habitat that you could gain access to um, in hopes that our distribution among the study area um, would drastically increase and there we would see a better response to, um, to, the, to the baited vaccine. And there's 216 of those and that takes a long time, uh, one kilometer at a time and there's averaging baits per square of somewhere between 100 and 113. So we began to change the way we were baiting um, because we weren't seeing the results that we really wanted in our uh, seroconversion rates, meaning what percentage of the animals we're sampling on the landscape that show a sufficient response to our uh, vaccine. So here's a good comparison between how we did it in 2017 with those six larger grids. Um, you can see the distribution is not very well. So we went to that those smaller grids in 18, and you can see it increased a little bit. We we're pretty happy about it. And then again, this past year, um, we get what I would call even better distribution amongst those cells. Again, there is some access um, issues, uh, but I feel that we did, we did pretty well. So moving on, just a snapshot, um, what we kind of saw for results in our 2018 um, free baiting results, because we would go in and trap and take biological samples before we put our bait out. So we know what sort of a baseline we have um, in the population on the landscape. And then we go in after in October, six weeks after we drop our baits in, in August of every year, and trap again and see, did we make that much of a difference? And how, you know, what sort of percentage of animals on the landscape at that point um, have taken the bait and responded to it, responded to the vaccine. So. An interesting note is if you look uh, uh, top left at raccoons in Burlington, um, we our baseline data was at 15.8%. So that's all that was remaining in the, in the population that we were able to sample at the time. So then we baited in, in August and we basically doubled our percentage. Still not really where we wanna be. We're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60% ideally uh, to create a decent barrier um, amongst the animals on the landscape. Skunks, on the other hand, were only 33% to begin with, which was pretty good pre-bait, but they didn't raise, they didn't double like the raccoons did. So a lot of questions came to mind. Do they not serial convert the same way that raccoons do? Um, are they not eating as many of the baits? Um, you know, what are some of the issues that we may have been having? As well, we were using this same bait you can see my cursor. So in Burlington, we're baiting at 150 baits per kilometer squared. That's pretty thick. In northeastern Vermont, we did some sampling at a quarter of that bait density. And we started at 55.6% and went to 68.9 at a quarter of the bait density. So what does that tell you? Yes, there's, le there's less raccoons, but it's working a lot better where there's less raccoons. Um, and skunks, we didn't catch any before we baited. Um, and we only caught one and it did not see or convert post bait. And again, that's in Northeastern Vermont, um, basically Caledonia County. Way different vacu vac uh, racu raccoon uh, densities, um, much di different landscape, a lot more rural, a lot of factors that go into this, but they seem to respond to it very well in a rural habitat, even at quarter of the bait density that we that we're using in Burlington. But then came along the opossum. Because we're thinking, well, we're pretty sure that in the Burlington area with the number of gray squirrels and other non-targets that they're stealing a lot of our baits. I'm sure there's a lot of hollow trees with squirrel nests in them that are just packed full of baits. <clears throat> but another question was, what other animals might there be uh, some bait competition with. You know, we were catching opossums regularly, but they're a non-target species. We would just let them go unharmed and um, never really thought about it until this year, about two years ago. And uh, so we said, hey, let's try to figure this out. So we set up a new study area here on the right-hand side. And this was kind of complex. Um, so it was an opossum study 
as well as a raccoon and skunk density study, because we still want to monitor our raccoons and skunks. They're primary rabies species vectors, um, rabies vector species in the state of Vermont. So we also deployed 50 collars to track and study urban ecology on opossums. And we're, at the same time, we were going to do three density studies to try to figure out the raccoon, skunk, and opossum densities in high and low human intensity areas. So the low in human intensity area here would be up in kind of more rural Colchester. Um, and the high intensity areas, are, of course, are you know the old North End and, and going into South Burlington. Very, very highly populated, as you, as you all well know. So we're going to do some biological sampling to determine age, tetracycline, and serology. Tetra tetracycline is what um, is added to our baited vaccine. It's a biomarker that shows up in the rings of the teeth um, of a sampled animal. If they've eaten the bait, it will show up in the rings of the teeth, just like the rings of a tree. So we can tell whether they've eaten it or not, um, simply by doing some biological sampling. And the goal was to compare raccoon, opossum, and skunk urban ecology based on previous data, of which we had two years of, because we had that urban ecology data from um, 16 and 17, uh, thanks to the graduate research project. So we had some challenges. It wasn't like our normal studies or research efforts. Um, we had to do another mass mailing to approximately 8,000 8, or so residents to gain permission to use, the, use their lands um, if they granted it to us. Because even though we're the US government, we can't just walk on your land and use it. We need permission to do so. Um, and it's up to us to disclose every method um, and species in which we're kind of targeting. Um, so that's what I mean by the 12A was our previous permissions that we had to target raccoons and skunks um, did not include opossums or other necessary components. So we needed to resend all that and that's quite a feat. That takes weeks and weeks and weeks to fold all those by hand and get them out in the mail. <clears throat> and you get a relatively low re response from it anyways. Um, so what we get is what we get and those are the only lands that we can use. So in the previous years, we had been using um, little metal ear tags, unique identifiers on raccoons and skunks, um, and even a few, a few red fox um, and gray fox. But it was for recommendation that we don't use those on opossums, because the one neat thing about them is that they're known to be a meticulous groomer, and they might literally just pull them out anyways. Plus, they're at this is like the northern part of their range. Um, and it's unfortunate, but a lot of times in a really, really cold and bad winter, um, some of their tails and ears may even freeze off a little bit. Therefore, we wouldn't be able to identify that animal um, if it didn't still have a ear tag in it the next time that we were able to capture it. So pit tags are what are used in fish a lot uh, by biologists, and it's passive integrated technology. And it's basically the same thing if you took your domestic pet to the vets and you wanted to get it chipped, quote unquote, this is the same sort of thing that they would put in your pet. It just goes sub, subcutaneously um, and, and it stays and it just travels with them and allows us to, to uh, know whether that's a recaptured animal when we capture one. Because you simply scan the animal and it'll tell you whether it has a chip, a chip in it. Um, some of the other challenges were we were already coordinating with a PhD student from Princeton. Um, so that included some sampling logistics. Um, where were we going to have her in our, you know, kind of assembly line of processing these animals and how was this all going to work? What sort of samples did she need at the same time that we were um, handling these animals? Um, the National Rabies Management Program also invited the head of the IA Cook Committee. Now, if you don't know what that is, it's the International um, Animal Care and Use Committee, um, who anytime you propose a study, um, they basically have to sign off on it and, and say, yep, we're okay with what you're going to do, go ahead and do it. Uh, but they did make some recommendations. Um, so then there was the implementation of those recommendations. How are we going to get this done? Some of the things we hadn't done before, uh, but we agreed that they were good ideas and that we were going to get through it and, and figure it out. So one of them was how do we administer warm saline to animals during recovery from anesthesia? 
Um, the other one was the use of a blood clotting agent after tooth extraction. Uh, we had not used that before. Um, we need to make sure animals waiting to be processed couldn't see those in recovery because of undue stress. For the same reason, we wanted to keep the, our processing location as quiet as possible, just to minis, minimize any, any stress. Animals under anesthesia um, can be stressed out, although they're not able to really respond to it, but it doesn't mean they're not being stressed. So we want to be sensitive to that too. Um, and other precautions for you know, any, any times where we would have excessive heat or excessive cold, uh, because under anesthesia, they're also not able to thermoregulate. So they can't warm themselves up or cool themselves down. So we need to keep that sort of thing in mind. So over two th uh, between 2018 um, and 2019, we did deploy 59 GPS collars, uh, both VHF and UHF, on 52 males and seven males. It was kind of a funny thing while we were trying to capture males um, in July of both those seasons. We just couldn't find them. I don't know where they go, but they're, they're either not around or not responsive or not attracted to um, what we're trying to give them at the time. It was kind of frustrating um, because ideally in a study like this, you would like to keep your sex ratio even so you can compare that data, but we weren't able to do that in this case. Um, we downloaded 43 of those collars with usable data, um, nine downloaded with not enough data, which is unfortunate, and seven are just still missing. You always have to accept some sort of loss. Um, they may, it might've been a collar failure, um, yeah, unfortunately, they may have been hit on the road and, and the collar went dead. We couldn't recover the collar. So, and there was 13 known mortalities out of almost 60 animals, which is not that bad, really. So this is just an example about our processing location. We're fitting collars on the possums and, and putting pit tags in them. And that center picture is that scanner I talked about where we can find out whether that animal already has a tag in it. So it wouldn't have before 2018, but it could have last year. And it may have in the fall of 2018. And just a couple of pictures of when we were locating these animals through radio telemetry. And, um, and we had to get just close enough to them uh, to be able to download the collar and get all that, all that data if we could. It's crazy kind of the places that you find them. Most of these homeowners, I'm sure don't know that they have opossums that are denning underneath their walkout porch. <laughs> and you find them way down deep in the woods too. This picture on the right is way down below St. Michael's College on the, by the cornfields there. Kind of fun to get out and interact with them. So what did we find after our 2018 <clears throat> study, the first time that we had ever put collars on opossums. We got home ranges of them based on modeling. So this is P11 and your pink dots there are um, baits that were actually spread on the ground in August between the time that collars were deployed um, and the time that we tried to recover them. <clears throat> so P11 had 66 baits actually in, in, um, in its home range and it actually did zero convert. So that was another question we had is being that opossums aren't known to be a rabies vector species, are they even gonna re react to the vaccine? So we had a lot of questions we were trying to answer here. And, um, but P28 only had 19 baits in its, uh, in its home range. So it wasn't able to intersect or it just didn't zero convert, but both um, important information for us to, for us to know. And then kind of a different part, switching gears, a big part of our program, uh, at least the rabies end of our program in, in the state of Vermont and, and nationally, certainly on the Eastern seaboard. In 2016, our national rabies program um, initiated what they call the ERS initiative. And what that was is we wanted to ramp up our surveillance. Um, so what would that be that that might be road kills being picked up. It might be responding to strange acting animals in very key areas where we, it's kind of an odd concept. We're not trying to find rabies. We're trying to not find it. We're trying to prove that what we're doing 
by the baiting activities that we are involved in is working. So what that, that outlined was um, a matrix. And what that matrix is, is a whole montage of different entities um, within the state that we could gather more and more samples from more than in the past so that we could ramp up our, our enhanced surveillance um, to get a better idea of what's going on out there in the landscape. Um, are we missing rabies positives? You know, what else is going on out there? So we wanted to prioritize our samples. Um, certainly strange acting animals um, are, are very important to us. Um, it's not always rabies, it actually seldom is, um, but we want to get those animals tested and, and so that we know what's going on out there. And that requires a lot of laboratory support too. So we, we partnered up with the Vermont Department of Health um, and they basically came on, online and said, yeah, we'll help you. We can test such, such amount of samples for you every week. Um, so that happened ever since the fall of 2016. Um, so we're very grateful to them. We also have another um, way to sample them kind of in-house, if you would. Um, we have um, certified tests that we have uh, an employee right now who is certified to do this test where we can uh, find out ourselves as well um, if we're, you know, in a situation where we might be overwhelming the Department of Health. Um, it also required a lot of extra data entry, monitoring, and analysis. And basically, the, the crux of this whole ERS initiative is monitoring and analyzing how you're monitoring and how you may need to, to change things up. So we had a bunch of cooperators come on board pretty quick um, and we provided them with these freezers and all the, uh, the PPE and the waste containers that they would need. If they didn't mind, if they found these animals or somehow got, these, got their hands on, you know, rabies vector species, you know, we certainly would want them for our ERS initiative. Um, and we had very good response with that. Right now we have 20, uh, I believe 20 or 21 freezer locations across the state. But right now, this is how we have um, kind of categorized where we want our samples from. And I'll get to why in a minute. Because we're most, this program originated many, many years ago and became an international initiative um, because the US and Canada wanted to stop the northern spread of rabies into, into Canada. And it was spreading um, at a pretty good rate, really, uh, many, many miles every year. So a critical zone for us is, is at the very top, right next to Canada. And we're also not baiting there anymore. So a high priority would be down by our office here in Berlin, Montpelier area as well. Um, because this is the bottom end of our bait zone right here. We do accept and go get strange acting animals from our lower priority zone, uh, but we try to triage those calls pretty carefully um, so that we're not, you know, underutilizing our effort. So what have we done over the years as far as surveillance goes? And what sort of animals are we, are we testing? This kind of gives you an idea of, of uh, of what we've done. So our ERS initiative ramped up in 2016 in the fall. So we had way more samples that we were testing um, as opposed to the last seven years, really. Um, this number was just in response to uh, an outbreak in the St. Saint, Saint Albans area in 2007. So our 2019 sampling effort statewide, the Department of Health tested 1,084 animals for rabies in 2019. 16 of those animals tested positive for rabies. And that consists of, ra of raccoons, bats, skunks, foxes, coyote, and actually one woodchuck. The Vermont Rabies Hotline, or Wildlife Services, we run the hotline out of our office. Um, triage, triage calls coordinating collection of animals exhibiting rabies-like symptoms or wildlife involved in exposures whether it be a human exposure, pet exposure, et cetera, and strange acting wildlife as well. Of the 1,084 animals tested by VDH, we collected and submitted 738 of those. So, and there's the breakdown of that. It's a pretty significant number. 
we're submitting roughly three quarters, if not a little better, of, of all the animals that they're testing. And we really appreciated their support and all that. Um, of all the animals that we collected, um, two of those did test positive for rabies. Samples that we get are provided by cooperators, as we call them, including could be state game wardens, other federal cooperators, um, maybe national wildlife refuges, um, nuisance trappers, roadkill surveys that we're doing it routinely as, as part of our ERS initiative, um, or a myriad of other ways, really. Um, we also tested 11 bobcats and 63 fisher using our, our DRIP method, which is direct rapid immunohistochemistry test, all of which tested negative for rabies. So this is kind of just a snapshot of what we've done. These are our three most valuable as lined out by the ERS initiative. We've actually had a, several road kills test positive for rabies. So if they're testing positive for rabies as roadkill, they may be strange acting. So those are very important samples for us. And this is just kind of the breakout of, of what percentage of, of uh, these rabies vector species um, that we're testing that we did in 2019, fiscal year. I mean, calendar year, sorry. So if we compare the positive rabies cases in 2018, uh, which I believe was 24, but three of those were, were, uh, were bats, which we're not really tracking. We're tracking terrestrial rabies instead of, I know bats are mammals, but that's more avian strain. And you can see where <clears throat> our bait zone was in 2018. We baited all the way from the Canadian border, well down into Addison County. But then, as of 2019, in an effort to, to start moving our bait zone south and, and really try to start pushing the terrestrial strain of rabies out of Vermont and back to the eastern seaboard um, toward the elimination of it, our national program said, you know what, we're going to take a leap and we're not going to bait up here by Canada anymore. So what did that mean to us? It means that north of our bait zone, we need to ramp up our surveillance. We need to know whether we left anything behind. Um, and if that's the case, we may need to go back to the drawing board. But this was the first step toward elimination of rabies. Um, and as of now, it, it, it seems to be working, but we've got a lot of sampling and stuff we're going to be doing this year as well. So. It's just a comparison of how much we baited in the state of Vermont um, as opposed to 2019. So what have we done in 2020 so far? Well, we've got 313 ERS samples submitted for testing to date. Um, <laughs> VDH, I, that's a spelling mistake, I apologize. Um, was able to test 56 of them for us in 2020 and still up in, in <clears throat> until all this COVID-19 stuff happened. And then basically they said, you know what, we don't really have time. And we said, we understand, we're not gonna bug you about it. Um, so we brought online a lot more intensive um, drip testing. Um, so, so far we've tested 257 through this method, um, either tested or in the process of being tested, I should say. We also have kind of ramped up our outreach. We've distributed 273 posters and flyers so far in 2020 in our, in our high priority area, um, up next to the Canadian border there where we're not baiting anymore. Because this is an effort to basically gain calls, gain interest from the public to, if they're seeing string acting area in that area, I mean, animals in that area, those are very important samples for us. And if we can get our hands on those, then that's what we want to do. We want to be able to test those and, and rule out the fact that it could be rabies. Um, so this is an effort to, as well as what I'm doing right now, um, and as well as what Brendan did with feral swine stuff, to get people to pick up that phone and call. Um, so we have received some calls through it. It hasn't been a great response yet, but we're, 
we're trying to figure out other ways for public outreach. Uh, we feel that's a very important part of our program at this point. Um, and at the same time, so far in 2020, we've driven 259 hours and 6,500 miles conducting roads, you know, standardized road surveys. Um, and those usually run about six to seven hours, one person in a vehicle, and that's pretty intensive. Um, so we're, we're pretty proud, proud about that. And that's gonna actually gonna be ramping up here shortly um, due to a new employee. So those are the things we're gonna be doing in 2020. We're also gonna be prioritizing our ERS for focus areas. We basically have done that by creating our critical zone there at the top of Vermont. But we also need to evaluate our roadkill survey or road survey route coverage. Are we covering all the roads that we can cover? How many different road surveys do we need to set up so that we are covering things spatially and temporally in time? Um, and like I just mentioned, public outreach. So we're trying to ramp that up. Um, and this is one of those efforts to do so, depending on where our listeners are from tonight. So this is the, this is the poster that we have put up. Um, as well as a rabies alert poster. I don't know if any of you have seen that. That's a Vermont Department of Health um, product that we also post with this. And some of the places that we, we have put them um, are places, community bulletin boards, uh, town clerks. We've posted them on town social media sites. Um, any sort of kiosk or general store, places where people gather and, and go to those community bulletin boards to see what's for sale or, or you know, see what's going on in the community. Uh, we've also distributed them at uh, Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department meetings. Um, we have been involved in the Vermont Trappers Association Trapper Rendezvous, and we've put the word out there. Um, we're doing community presentations such as right now. Uh, we've been involved with a few different towns of town police um, where we had an event this year, but I got canceled to COVID-19. Uh, but we're just trying to get the word out that this is what we're doing and if there's any way you can help us that would be great and we would be much appreciated much appreciative <clears throat> so this is our proposed what we call bait zone for 2020. so you can see it's it still doesn't go all the way to the canadian border which is up here <clears throat> this is going to be helicopter baited for the first time in Vermont. And this is a hand baiting zone where we literally place them by hand. So is in Montpelier and Barry um, and Milton. So that lets you know where we're baiting um, this coming year. And if you are able to hear any of the public announcements or, or press releases or anything like that, then you'll know who's doing it and, and what we're doing. Um, so again, over here in Northeastern Vermont, and in parts of Grafton County in New Hampshire, um, we're still only baiting at 37 and a half baits. So that's, that's half of our normal, which is 75. But we've ramped up over here to 150 baits per square kilometer. So again, we've had done a lot of sampling over here. We have good results over here and a little undesirable results around here. So, that's our goal is to try to figure that out. And um, it's been a process so far and it may be a few more years and maybe longer than that, but that's our goal. We want to be able to target um, and put baits in front of the animals, the rabies vector species that are traveling in urban, um, urban and suburban habitats um, in order to help us you know, stop the spread of rabies and also back up the fact that we are trying to eliminate it and push it out of the state. It may be many years. It may not be, you know, we did this in last year. We may not hopscotch this down for another two or three years. Who knows? We have to, we got to see what our results are. Um, so that's why we're doing intensive sampling um, in our ERS initiative to really monitor what's going on up here the best we can so that we know that we didn't leave anything behind. So with that, we've been about 45 minutes, barring a little um, electronic problem in the beginning. Um, I could take some questions. And if I would just say up front that if I have not 
positive about answering them, I can get you um, the answers and, and get them back to you. All right, terrific. Thanks so much, Owen. We have a bunch of questions coming in. Um, oh boy. <laughs> all good ones. Um, one, I'll, I'll kind of do these in, in reverse order, folks. Um, one is, is there uh, rabies info by species or town or year available on the state's website? Yes, there is. They actually have a very interactive, um, we have the Vermont Department of Health is where you're going to want to find that. And um, we've got a new state public health veterinarian and she kind of headed up this whole new interactive uh, rabies data um, parcel of their, their website. So you can see positives by town, by year, um, I believe even by county, if that's information that you're, that you're looking to get. Super, I'm actually pulling it up right now. I'll put a link to that in the chat bar here. And I'll, when we post this uh, video to our website, I'll yeah. also put a link to that underneath. Um, sometimes, it, sometimes it can be a little tough to find. I believe it's under on your left-hand side if you go under uh, zoonotic diseases. Okay. All right, well, I have uh, the link I, I can send to you if you want. Okay, sure, yeah. We'll, we'll make sure that gets up underneath the, uh, the uh, recording of this so people can access that. That would be great. Um, let's see, uh, Erica's wondering, do chipmunks and squirrels get or transmit rabies? Well, any warm-blooded mammal can. They are not known to be a vector and for the reason that they're, it's known that they're, they're very unlikely to survive an attack from an actual rabid animal. Therefore, they would not be able to pass it on. But there have been some rare cases of small mammals um, throughout the years like that. And then um, how many domestic animals test positive in Vermont over your research period? Oh, again, I'd have to refer to, um, refer to the VDH website. Um, it's, it's very few. It tends to be cats if anything, but in the past, in history, there has been even a few cows, sheep, um, um, and dogs, but it's, it's pretty rare. Let's see, uh, Danny's wondering, uh, why are raccoons, skunks, and foxes more prone to contract rabies and are therefore classified as RVS? You'll have to remind us what RVS stands for. Uh, rabies vector species. Um, it's just those, those, Smaller, what are considered to be mesocarnivores, um, are just really susceptible to it. It has a lot to do with the disease's incubation period inside the body and how easy um, it's able to be spread by those particular species. That's how they become rabies vector species. So that has to do with body temperature. It has to do with seasonal activities. Um, there's many different factors there. Um, I have a couple others I'd like to ask uh, while waiting. If anybody else has any additional questions they'd like to, to add to the chat bar, now's a good time to do that. Um, I'm wondering um, in, in your research, or I should say in the, um, in the deployment of, of all the baits and the, and the testing here, is there a certain percentage of seroconversion that you're looking for to call it, to call it enough? Like obviously it would be impossible to really get 100% seroconversion, but, but do you feel like there's a number you're looking for where you say, okay, this population here is, is you know, it's for all intents and purposes protected. Right, yes. So I should have expanded on that a little bit um, when I was back on those slides, but so yes, we're, we're not gonna ever um, attain 100%, which would be ideal because we simply can't, you know, there's some animals that just will never come across the bait. Um, and even when we're drawing bi biological samples and, and doing our trapping activities, there's some animals that you'll never catch. So you'll never get samples off of. That's just a fact. In the rabies community, it is thought that somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 70% will, would be very sufficient to create um, a real strong barrier against any movement of the disease. And that's really the point. And I'm wondering if you could walk us through a little bit, um, for those of us that haven't seen these baits before, just kind of a couple of questions around that. Can you describe what these baits look like, what they're composed of, um, and, 
and I'm sure folks will be wondering, you know, is 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 this going to zero convert my dog if my dog finds one of these and and eats it? Um, so what are these? What's the story? No, it, it's not. So so the baits that we used to use that were called VRG. I had that on a slide, but I, just one one spot. Um, were what was called the coated sachet, um, and it's a pressurized packet that is covered in fish meal. And so that serves to attract the animal to the bait as they're rummaging around out through the woods during their activities. Um, and then that pressurized packet, so they bite into it, they think it's food. Um, they bite into it, it squirts in their mouth. The natural response is to swallow. Um, so they don't even need the whole amount of liquid, which is the vaccine inside the bait um, to, begun, uh, to be, become uh, sufficiently vaccinated against the virus. So that was the bait that we used to use. We didn't have great luck with it for many, many, many years. And then this bait that we're using now, actually Canada has been using for years and they've been having a lot better response to it. So we decided we'd start using it and initiate the field trial in the state of Vermont and New York and New Hampshire. Um, and it seems to be a better bait delivery method for the vaccine. So. It is again a pressurized packet um, that looks kind of like a ketchup packet, maybe a little smaller. Um, and it's coated in this insanely sweet caramel type smelling stuff. Um, they come frozen, so they need to be distributed because they don't last that long on the landscape. Um, and the same idea, the packet inside is pressurized, they bite into it, it squirts in their mouth, they swallow, should be a done deal. So they're brown in color, like dark tan in color. And on the back side of them, I don't know if any of the listeners have found them, there is actually a number that you can call if you found them and we'll walk you through what to do with it. And we do receive calls of domestic pets, um, although very, very few. I mean, we're spreading 500,000 baits across the state and we may get six or eight calls a year from people. So the percentage is not very high, but we'll, if you call the Vermont Rabies Hotline, if that happens, which is where that number will, will root you to, um, we can walk you through and triage that call and let you know what you may or may not need to do. Great. Um, so it sounds like, you know, if, if, uh, if a raccoon or a skunk comes across just one of these, that ought to be enough for, to, for it to zero convert. Um, so they don't need to come across several of these in their, in their territory. Right, right. That's that's the that's the theory. Although you may have individual animals out there that consume more than one. Right. Um, from a, I'm just curious about the 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 in, the amount of time that it takes to to deploy these baits. I'm I'm thinking about your uh, figures from Burlington, for instance. Um, how long does it take to to fully deploy, you know, these across across the city? Is that a, a one day effort? A one month effort? Oh no, it's um, it's usually about a week and a half effort, um, involving several different employees and vehicles, and I, I believe it took 556 hours last year. So it's it's pretty intensive, and it, again, it depends on how many crews we have available to 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 do that on a on a daily basis. But we want to get them out there because we then we we allow you know, them to be on the landscape for six weeks. And that's when we go and then do our biological sampling uh, through trapping efforts. And, and we find out, you know, what sort of response we had. Sure. Um, well, I believe that's all we have for questions. If anybody else has any, any lingering questions, um, please throw it in the chat bar. Um, in the meantime, I just want to say thank you to you, Owen, and your team and to Wildlife Services for, for your work on all this. Uh, we really appreciate all this, uh, this information. Um, this, is, this is important stuff, and I'm really glad that there's some concrete ways in which the public can, can, uh, can help your research and, uh, and help um, mitigate rabies in Vermont. And um, yeah, and I just want to say thank you very much. And um, yeah, um, uh, last word over to you, Well, Owen. I'd like to say thank you to my audience. Yeah, no, I'd, I'd like to say thank you very much for the opportunity. It's good for us to be involved with the public and, and, and transparent, transparency. And, and uh, sorry, that's my dog. My wife is getting home. <laughs>
Um, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak in front of you folks. And if you ever are in a situation where you need help with rabies vector species or you know any other nuisance animal or anything like that, feel free to call the Vermont Rabies Hotline. Um, it's either 1-800-4-RABIES or 1-800-472-2437. And we'll walk you through what, uh, what can be done. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Take care. Have a good week. Have a good weekend and be well. All right. Thank you, Sean.